6 p.m. Where you don't miss a thing. Now, we've just been talking about recycling, so why don't we talk about sustainability and how we can save money by not having to spend as much on electricity and gas and heating and cooling and all that kind of stuff. And none other than John Brody from Vim Sustainability joins us. G'day, John. Oh, good afternoon there, Jason. How are you? Yeah, not doing too badly. Now, John, I wanted to ask you, just before we get started, we, we talked briefly last week about shade cloths, and mm. it kind of occurred to me during the week that shade cloths, they come in all different colours. Are the colours going to make much of a difference to how it feels underneath the shade cloth that you've bought? Uh, look, probably not. You'll probably find the weave has more of an impact, but then again, if you think about it... Um, it's something I haven't really considered, but if you think about it, putting a black shade cloth up or a black um, membrane would probably be a little bit hotter underneath than a white one. Because that absorbs the heat. heat. Yeah, yeah, because black absorbs the heat. Yeah. Gotcha. So, yeah, look, it probably does actually have a, have, have an impact on the uh, on the colour on, on the uh, temperature underneath. Yeah. Interesting. So, uh, I guess going for the lighter colours is probably important if what you're trying to do is uh, is block some of the heat out. Well, one one of the the big issues that comes with the design of buildings is the colour of the roof. Oh. And, uh, li yeah, living over in Sydney, I drive around and I see all of these buildings with black roofs, dark brown tiles, dark black tiled roofs, and I think, gee whiz, that just doesn't seem to fit this climate. Now, if I was in Hobart, yeah, it'd probably be a fantastic idea to put a darker roof in or in Canberra or somewhere, but in our temperatures of Perth and Sydney, because we have similar climates, the uh, light-coloured roofs, because it's a hot climate pr predominantly, the light-coloured roofs will reduce uh, your heat loads in your house by maybe 3 to 4%. So sort of the galvanised tin, that sort of zinc loom stuff, would, is that okay? That's not great, no. It's better to be actually like a white colour. Oh, and no. there's a product on the market now that is a white-coloured uh, roofing material that actually has a special coating on it um, to reduce heat loads by up to 8%. Or well, you can buy your own... Uh, coatings and paint them on, but there's now a proprietary product on the market that enables people to buy a roofing sheet that already has this uh, heat-resistant coating on it that will reduce the heat loads. Well, 8% is quite a lot of heat reduction in a, in a house. Well, I was just about to ask that. So I know there's a lot of services over here who will come and paint your roof for you. Now, that's going to cost you easily a couple of grand, if not three or four grand. Do you reckon that you're going to get back that uh, in terms of how much money you're spending on energy? Uh, look, that's a that's a hard that's a hard one because uh, painting a roof on its own can be problematic because there's other areas that you might find you get better bang for your buck mm. um, by putting maybe insulation in the roof or ventilating the roof. But if you're building a new home, uh, the extra over cost of putting this uh, proprietary product on the roof is is very very minimal. Or put or just put a light coloured like a white or an off white roofing product on your roof you'll you'll still get you know like it's all little bits sustainability is not there's no silver bullet with sustainability i can't wake up tomorrow morning and say right i'm going to reduce the world's energy consumption by 50 percent by doing that it's all little bits 10 percent three percent one percent two percent all of those little bits add up to a sustainable outcome and that's what you've got to look at you can't just do one thing and think that's going to be a massive difference it's all little bits and pieces so councils could help there they could mandate that in new developments for example that you must have a light colored roof well that would make a lot of sense uh for sure and it's obviously it's climate driven as i said but if we go back to what we talked about last week about the heat island effect this massive amount of heat that's being absorbed by our cities continually because of all the dark colours and the heavy mass, the heavy materials, the asphalt, the uh, the dark roofs, the concrete boxes uh, that, that are our buildings, the huge glass areas, all, all absorbing heat into the buildings, into the, into the ground. You can see that the value of starting to change the colour of our roofs, putting uh, light coloured roofs or putting uh, what we call uh, roofs with, with, with um, flora on them, uh, with plants and on these what they call green roofs. This sort of stuff is, is, is where we're going to be moving with the way that cities are designed. That's very interesting because, uh, you know, you look at the existing cities we've got and there's a lot of arguments to say you want to stop urban sprawl uh, and that means making the, the living slightly more dense as you get nearer to the CBD. But these seem to be competing demands, really. Uh, the whole urban design uh, equation is full of com competing demands, and there's a there's, there's about three or four different camps that espouse you know urban sprawl is better than this intensification, intensification is better than urban sprawl. It's a really complicated area, and I'm certainly not the person to be involved in in the detail of that discussion. 
um, but there's there's a lot of to and froing about what is the best option. But I mean, one of the key things is transport nodes. If we don't have transport, uh, then we go and build this huge urban sprawl like's happened in Sydney, and there's no transport there. So there's hundreds of thousands of people living without any transport. So we get 45 trillion cars on the roads, and we get all of the ramifications of that bring. So there's a lot of work going on. Uh, uh, in the work, I do the work with Sydney University, and a lot of work going on there regarding urban planning and urban climatology and, and, and subjects like that. Now, uh, I was just thinking about my house that I've got at the moment. Now, we bought this house and it was already built, but one of the things I noticed about it when we first walked through it is that it's got skylights everywhere. Now, it's a fantastic touch because what it means is during the day, we don't actually have to put any lights on. Look, skylights uh, have uh, good and bad points. It depends on the type of skylight. Obviously, you get the daylight in, which is great. Mm. But if they're not properly designed or properly specified, you can end up with a lot of heat load from them. Uh, so okay. in summer, you've got that sun coming through. So you need to get the right type of skylight. And ideally, if you get a skylight, you need to make them ventilated so that they can open, so they can help get the hot air hot air out at night time, so you can almost do a bit of night purging in your in your ah, home. Ah, I see. What about just those whirly birds that you see on top of people's roofs? Are they enough? Look, I I I uh, I, I don't know about the efficacy of whirly birds. I, I I'm yet to be convinced of what that they actually do anything, but they certainly seem to be a lot of them. But yeah. the trouble with a whirly bird is you've got to actually supply the air in as well. So. You've got something going around on the roof that you know that could fail. It's a moving part, and then you've got to get the air into them as well. So look, you know, I'm, uh, the jury's still out on them for me. I, I know that uh, solar power is something that a lot of people are interested in at the moment, but to me, it almost feels like people are overlooking a much older technology that's been around a long, long time, and that's solar hot water systems. Are they still something that we should be considering? Solar hot water systems to me are just a no-brainer. Yeah. Solar hot water systems, and if you're smart, if you use the solar hot water, there's a lot of things you can use it for as well. Like you can use it for heating your house as well as using it for your showers. You can use it for heating your drying room, so you can run the solar hot water through a cupboard or a room that becomes a drying room like they do down in the ski lodges. But ah. that's something that's becoming a little bit more prevalent. Uh, here in Sydney, some of the projects we've worked on, we've put forward this idea of drying cupboards run by solar hot water. You couldn't also use it to uh, run the hot water into your uh, washing machines and into your dryers, your dishwashers and your dryers. There's also a movement towards that area where the drying fun or the heating function uh, doesn't come from electricity. It actually comes from solar hot water, even in things like clothes dryers. So wow. There's, there's movement forward in that area because solar hot water is such a great way to provide heating, energy free, cost free. It's, it's fantastic, yeah. Uh, John, do you know much about the fuel cell technologies that are starting to come out in the US now? No, I don't. It's an area that I don't have a lot of expertise in. Uh, I know that there's a lot of research going on and they're still not ready. They still think, every time I read about it, it's, you know, 10 years away. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> well, one, one of the things that I've been really impressed with lately is a concept called the Green Garage. Now, this is a concept that's come out of America, and what they're doing is they're taking uh, very small cars. What they want to do is instead of having cars fully electric, they want to use the cars and have them as a hybrid, a bit like a Toyota Prius, but with even more fuel-efficient motors and electric motors. And what they do is that they drive you. Just imagine you drive your car to work, uh, and the little fuel, the little you know, two um, two two hundred cc or four hundred cc motor charges the battery and it's a very, very clean motor, so it's a very, very clean way to generate electricity. You get to work, you plug your car into the grid, all the battery power from 500,000 cars discharges into the grid, then you get up, get back to work to go home, you get in your car, you start your car up, you drive home, it generates and charges the batteries, you get home, you plug it into the grid. And so all those area times where there's where there's cars sitting around, they're actually generating power back into the grid. Yeah. They're generating it a lot more efficiently than a power station. And uh, this is an area that I'm, th I'm hoping, and a lot of people in America hoping, it's got a big growth area where they're changing the whole concept around. So we're using electric cars, but we're also using them to create power back into the grid. John, one last question before I let you go. How soon before you're in an electric vehicle? Look, look, I would buy one tomorrow if I could afford one. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, my wife could use one and never, ever, ever have to use anything else because she would do maybe 100 kilometres, 120 kilometres a day on her way to work. Electric vehicle would be fantastic, but they are so expensive they at the are. moment. But it's yeah. only 
that the, they're predicting 10 to 20 percent of all cars by 2020 will be electric, and I, I actually believe that's what, how it's going to move forward. Yeah. So. As soon as the price comes down, I'm into an electric vehicle, that's for sure. You and me both, mate, I can tell you. John, thanks so much for joining us. How can people find out more about what your company does? Uh, www.vim.net.au. Fantastic. John, we'll talk to you again next week. Look forward to it, mate. Cheers, mate. That's uh, John Brody there from Vim Sustainability. This is the Sunday Session with Jason Jordan. It's a quarter away from five. Uh